thank you so much, James. And uh, it's a privilege to be here and a privilege to get to share some of what I feel is the truth and balance about this very, very important area dealing particularly with, with hurricanes. And yes, I've thrown, flown through the eye wall into the eye uh, over 100 times. Uh, in different terms, we have people who have done over 500 times, so I'm just a, a novice. <laughs> and I just want to mention that although I'm drawing on research and data from NOAA and numerous other resources, plus my own research and experiences at the Hurricane Research Division, uh, where I work, I'm here on my own time and my views are are not necessarily represent the official views of my employer. And by the way, this has nothing to do with the subject matter. This is our standard uh, thing that we say when we do something on our own personal time. Uh, so it's not like they're trying to muzzle me on talking about this issue. So I want to talk about what we call the mythical link. Uh, they, they keep trying to blame everything on climate change. And uh, and hurricanes happen. That's a, that's a critical thing. They're nothing new. This is in, there's an extensive historical, I mean, this is kindergarten stuff, but the historical record of devastating hurricanes for hundreds of years, tropical cyclones, by the way, I use hurricanes, tropical cyclones interchangeably, they're called typhoons in some areas, all sorts of names, but tropical cyclones is the generic name, and they're a very naturally occurring weather system. Neil Frank said they're like nature's big egg beaters to balance out the heat from the tropics with the cold up north. Man doesn't cause them. Can we all say that to ourselves? Man doesn't cause them and cannot stop them. And in fact, on the Hurricane Research Division Tropical Cyclone FAQ page, I worked on tropical cyclone modification and myth. It talks about all sorts of theories about how to stop stop them. People will write us, blow up bombs, do this, drag a big <laughs> iceberg. I mean, you name it. But we've got it all discussed on there and why they would not work. And... Uh, and the issue is we can't stop them. But, you know, people say, well, are they getting more freaking and stronger? But I'm going to say right now, if we cut the CO2 emissions, say everything they say about man-made climate change was correct. Let's assume that for a minute. If we cut all the CO2 emissions worldwide, did that for 100 years, we would still get hurricanes. And we would still get devastating hurricanes. We would still get a decent number of them. Now, they get lots of attention. Why? Because they last for days, weeks, more. Tornadoes, bing, they're, they're here and they're gone within hours or a day or something, the potential landfalling tropical cyclones get lots of media and public attention. The more intense they are, the more people they can affect, the greater the attention. <laughs> when they affect land, especially heavily populated areas, the impacts can be extensive and long-lasting over a large area. I mean, this is like when we got hit by Andrew, it was like 100 tornadoes going through our cities. I mean, it's huge, the, the impact, especially for the major hurricanes, what we call Category 3, 4, 5. And usually, nowadays, 24-7 media coverage before, during, and after, and the tendency for the mainstream media and many politicians to blame any weather disaster on man-made climate change. And I'll just mention, I'm, I'm one of the writers of the NOAA Seasonal Outlook each year for the hurricane activity, and I say, well, I don't know if our forecast will be right, but I can make one forecast 100% certain that if we have a strong, devastating storm, that someone will blame it on man-made climate change, and it happens every time. I'm always right. Uh, but I have a lot of experience. This is not just me looking at other people's stuff. Sure, I draw in on other people's research, but I personally have had interactions with numerous hurricane scientists. I'm going to have some very wordy slides, and I'll skip over stuff, but you can always look at the archive if you want to read everything uh, later. But we have lots of scientists at, at the Hurricane Research and the National Hurricane Center, people visiting us, and many are the top in their areas globally. My own personal research with forecast models and climate mm -hmm. studies, I've been in the hurricane field program and numerous flights around many hurricanes in the NOAA aircraft, the Gulfstream aircraft, even dealt with processing data from the drone, the uh, Global Hawk drone that we used for several years. I have first-hand knowledge how the data is used to determine position and intensity of hurricanes and how that data is used to, and how it's gathered, quality control finalized, part of the seasonal hurricane forecast team uh, since its beginning. And I experienced the full impact of Hurricane Andrew, Category 5, uh, one of the only four Category 5 storms that we've seen to hit the United States. And this is this is why I take it so seriously. Okay, I'm not just some scientist in an ivory tower. I mean, the top middle picture... Oh, by the way, my first daughter, poor child, was born 12 hours before the eye wall of Andrew hit Miami <laughs> and destroyed our house. Uh, oh. And half of Miami, 12 hours before. She's 27 now. And, uh, and gorgeous. Hi, Pearl. And, uh, and But the middle picture is our house. That's a concrete port, steel rod, reinforced gable end, ripped in pieces. Uh, the bottom is our house. You'll notice there's no roof. Uh, that was lifted off in one piece carrying the tie beam. 
And the wall on the right, that white wall kind of on the right, lower right, is what was on top of nine of us. Myself, three sons, brother and sister, and their three sons. And by the way, 92 was a slow year. It doesn't take a lot of activity to have these disasters. And we have them. We wondered, originally it was 931 millibirds. We were talking a lot about observations. And based on one additional piece of observation, they lowered to 922. And then they decided it was CAT 4. Ten years later, they upgraded to CAT 5. There's all sorts of things going on with these measurements uh, with Andrew. But, and now, because I'm going to talk about climate change, global warming, I want to define some things. And I know this is the thing where everybody's talking about this, but I want to personally define it. And number one, I like the term AGW, anthropogenic or man-made global warming, otherwise known as Al Gore warming. And uh, <laughs> it's not the same as global warming. People just say the term global warming. I said, you mean man-made or you mean natural? It's not the same as climate change. Just because climate change happened doesn't mean it's AGW. I believe in climate change. The climate's always changing. Okay, or climate fluctuations. If not, there wouldn't be climate science. And I do a lot of climate science. And just because weather is happening, disaster it doesn't mean it's AGW. Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore's movie, The Cop 25, Dear Greta, and most of the media are not talking about AGW. They're talking about CAGW. That's very important. They're talking about catastrophic anthropogenic global This is horrible. Everybody's going to die, more storms, more, et cetera. And the fact there are numerous scientists, some are gathered here, who do not expect catastrophic anthropogenic global warming, but can agree we can have catastrophic climate change. The climate shifts in tremendous ways through the decades and through the millennia. And the problem is the media and some of the scientific community, there is censorship, bias, and distortion. We could spend a whole hour just talking about that. So this is the AGW mantra. And by the way, in their mind, AGW is the same as anthropogenic climate change, same as global, same again. If they even say the word climate, they mean that. And it's just so ridiculous. But if it's Listen, if it's hotter, if it's colder, if it's wetter, if it's drier, if there's more snow, less snow. Now, ever, all of you have seen headlines on all these things. I mean, one of these things happened. Oh, it's I mean, climate change. Uh, if there's more hurricanes, stronger hurricanes, but fewer hurricanes? No, they wouldn't say that because it's all supposed to be bad. They want to scare you. So what are some of the expected changes in hurricane activity based on the latest research with climate change? is the latest science based on the global climate models. Um, in This is the current consensus. By the way, the reason I put El Nino in there is because these models cannot, there is no reliable method right now to predict El Nino, an onset of El Nino event, even a few months in advance. I deal with that all the time when we make our predictions, excuse me, for the hurricane season. That's a few months. And we expect these models to be right 25, 50, 100 years. Uh, it's a dirty little secret. The secret, the models are not doing well. The overall number of storms, this is what they say, the overall number of storms might decrease the slight increased intensity of the stronger storms. By the way, that slight increase is so small that it probably isn't even within our ability to measure. But it has to be something bad. They have to, oh, there's going to be stronger storms. And they expect this. The models simply suggest it. I'm sorry. That's all you can say in a paper. I challenge that all the time. And it's a non-verifiable hypothesis. We can't even measure that accurate on the observations. The observational network's always changing. And you have to wait for decades for it to happen. So you can just throw out all these things. When the Hurricane Center makes a prediction what's going to happen in two days with the hurricane, they have to eat crow right away if they're wrong or celebrate if they're right. And, you know, but this, they can just say whatever they want and wait for decades. The key issue is how much can we trust the historical, even the current database of hurricane intensity. You don't know how many discussions we have about how strong a certain storm was, how we call it, how we decide it. It's not just you plug in a little number and stick your finger in the air and say, oh, it's a cat five. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. Now, some of the studies make extreme conclusions. I mean, and I can't go, there's so many of these studies, they just come one after another. I just shake my head with a lot of them because I am one of the experts in this field and I wish we could answer and respond to all of them. And there's just so many of it. One of, one of the studies from 2005, Webster et al, doubling of the Cat 4 and 5 hurricanes, doubling, that they said they've been doubling in the last 30, 40 years. I use that as a poster child, I'm sorry, for a very erroneous paper. And it was published in Science. Dramatic increases in frequency and intensity. Slower moving. They say, oh, now they're moving slower than they were before. Uh, now they're, uh, sorry, I'm looking at technical stuff. Okay, don't have to worry about it. Uh, they're, that they're moving slower than they were before. Believe me, we've had a lot of stalled hurricanes in the past. Oh, more moisture, more rainfall. And there's answers for all those things. And I can only touch a couple things in, in this talk here. But you can look at other talks and even contact me personally. But what are the main problems with these studies? They depend on the climate models, which are not very well, very good. And
and they depend on the model forecast of what it would be like in a double CO2 world to be correct. So in other words, they take that those results, assuming they're correct, and then plug in other stuff into them. So if those aren't correct, everything else is wrong. And they rely on the models being able to show tropical cyclone activity accurately. And that's to see that in a climate model, they have ways to do it. I'm not saying everything is wrong, but it's not extremely reliable. And they have an improper use. This is the main bottom line. Improper use and understanding of the nuances and the characteristics of the historical tropical cyclone, uh, I didn't mean studies, data, of the historical hurricane data. Now, this is a lot of stuff, but I wanted to put everything up there and I'll just touch on a few things. The problems with using historical database is temporally, through the years, it's not homogeneous. It has changed dramatically. Before 1944, all you had was ship obs and land obs. And guess what? The ships, if they could measure a hurricane was nearby, they didn't go into the center to measure it for us. Okay, they avoid the hurricane, usually in most cases. So you didn't get those observations, you mainly got them over land, uh, and occasionally with ships. The recon aircraft, at the beginning, 1944, I heard how they measured them. They had a guy in the bottom of the plane and he looked down and looked at the waves and tried to estimate it from the waves. And sometimes his commanding officer would say, no, it can't be that strong and knock down the, I mean, there's all sorts of things going on. They knew it was a hurricane. They knew it was a strong hurricane, but not very accurately. And they even measured for a little while, the Atlantic is the only one routinely measured by reconnaissance aircraft. In West Pacific, they measured, they haven't done that since 87 routinely. The, uh, the instruments, and I've seen the instruments just evolve on these planes and get better and better and better. And the interpretation of the data we get is changing. That's why Andrew was changed from Cat 4 to Cat 5 10 years later. There are improvements in the land observations. Then finally, satellite observations came. Well, satellite observations back in 1966 and even up to 1980, 85, were very different from what we're seeing right now. You know how they made the satellite loops before? They would have to print out every satellite picture. Dr. Neil Frank, who was director of the Hurricane Center, we laugh about this, and do a, a camera and take still frames of each one and then get it. I mean, it was amazing the different stuff we had back then. And satellites get better and better. We didn't even have what's called the Dvorak technique originally. So you can't look back at the original data like you look at current data. And then the spatial non-homogeneity. I mean, it depends, the quality depends tremendously on different basins, different parts of the Atlantic Basin. I mean, the aircraft uh, only flew out <coughs> so far. Where are the ship tracks, the satellite coverage? I remember looking at satellite coverage in 1980, 1982. And if something was in the Far East Atlantic, you did not have good satellite coverage of it. Uh, and many of the, it's interesting that many of the increases in some of these papers line up with the data coverage. In other words, Bad data coverage to good data coverage. Oh, look at the increase, and I'll show something later. This is one of my favorite slides. This is from Dr. Chris Lancey, who's, again, currently with Hurricane Center, used to be with us. And, uh, and this, what this is, is back to about 100 years, the percent of hurricanes that affected land, tropical cycles in the Atlantic Basin. So you can see before reconnaissance on the left, many years it was 100%. Why? Because it didn't hit land, they didn't know it was out there. And then all of a sudden we got aircraft reconnaissance in the middle, very few years with 100%, dropped dramatically. Then we got satellite, dropped again. And you really think there were fewer hurricanes percent hitting land nowadays than before? Maybe it is, global warming is. Climate change is making less hurricane landfall. Of course not, it's the observational network. And there's so many people I've seen study after study, they don't take this stuff into account. This is a beautiful slide also from Chris Lancey. Uh, the 2005 hurricane season, some of you might remember Katrina and Wilma, what a crazy year. It started, I think, in May and ended the following January. Uh, and just so many storms out there. But if you look at 1933, because you look at the left, it was an extremely busy year. Nothing in the eastern Atlantic. Well, as one certain meteorologist said, oh, that's because they're forming further east now than they did before. Oh, nonsense. We didn't have any data coverage out there. Sure, there were storms <laughs> out there. Nonsense, not to think of. Now, let me just talk about a few uh, disasters that they blame on uh, climate change. When I say climate change, I'm saying it like they mean it, man-made climate change. You have the Bay of Bengal cyclone, usually very, very deadly. So in uh, 2008, 100,000 people killed by flooding by Bay of Bengal cyclone. So we think, ah, global warming, climate change, everything. Well, well, if you look back a little bit, hmm you see actually climate change has reduced. In the, right? I mean, 1970, sadly, a half a million people died from one tropical cyclone there. And you had many years where you had a lot of damage. Uh, 
How about Katrina, the New Orleans disaster? By the way, that's our P-3 aircraft. I was on the landfall flight while I was hitting New Orleans and Mississippi. And the guy on the right is Chris Lancey, who I mentioned. Michael Black, second from the right, who passed away a couple of years ago. I just have to mention him by name because he's the one who did all a lot of work on GPS drop sods and many aspects of hurricane uh, studies. And uh, we actually dropped his ashes into the eye of Hurricane Michael last year. And I got to be careful of that because I get emotional. He was a good friend of mine, but we dropped his uh, ashes into the eye of Hurricane Michael. It's Michael Black. And, uh, but anyway, why was it a disaster? Was it AGW or the levees? It was the levees that broke. In fact, uh, uh, New Orleans got the weak side of the storm, but it was enough to break the levees, and sadly, it was faulty evacuation. A lot of those people could have left. They've had a lot of school buses. They were just flooded. They didn't use those to get the people out. People wanted to stay in their homes. Max Mayfield from the Hurricane Center told them, if you're going to stay in your home, have a hatchet with you, an ax, because you're going to have to go up to your attic, and you're going to have to use that ax to dig up on your roof, because the whole city's going to flood. And that's indeed what happened. So now how about damages? Okay, so even if you adjust for inflation, you go back 100 years. This is from Pilkey and Lancey. Uh, you go back 100 years, look how the damages increase. Must be ADW, right? Uh, well, if you adjust it by one other thing for inflation and population value adjustment, no trend whatsoever. Why? Because there's a lot more people living on the coast and a lot more property value. So the damages are much higher nowadays. Meaning if you would have the 1926 hurricane now with this great hurricane that hit Miami, it would be more like $80 billion in damage rather than whatever it was back then. Uh, now you have, say you look at tropical storm and, and hurricane numbers uh, over a century. So this is again from Lancey et al. He's done a lot of great work. And, uh, and you see, man, look at that trend. It's going up and up, must be global warming. Even natural global warming, let's blame it on that. The problem is the data was so bad that they missed a lot of the short-lived and, and storms out there in the Atlantic. And so he did some adjustments, some very reasonable adjustments. The trend totally disappeared. If you properly handled the data, I actually can't read the number. You haven't even marked it, but I believe you. I've got my timer. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, this was very interesting. Uh, a globally consistent reanalysis of tropical cyclone variability. What it was, by Kossin and all, is they took the satellite data, the older satellite data, and to make it consistent with the newer satellite data, they degraded the new satellite data. So therefore, they have this homogeneous satellite record, and when they did it, all the trends disappeared. When you do a good analysis, Hurricane Dorian, which was just this year, uh, measured extensively by aircraft with all the latest instruments, more no emissions than ever before, by the way, they said, oh, this tied with the 1935 Labor Day storm. I laughed. I was so upset when they said that. I said, you had no aircraft, no satellite, very few observations. There's no way you know exactly how strong that storm was. It's very, very much estimated. And they complain, oh, it's moving slowly, stalling, must be, they blame everything on AGW. But what's really happening in the Atlantic, and this is from studies that I've done and stuff, is the multi-decadal scale change. I'm going to wrap up with this stuff, is because this is, this is the real changes and the real danger, is if you look back, we have high activity era, meaning overall more activity for a few decades, lower activity in the middle, and then higher activity. Not that you don't have disasters in the, in the low activity era, that was Hurricane Andrew was in that era. You just don't have as many of the storms. And since 1995, we switched to this high activity era. And above the green line is hyperactive. No hyperactive years in the low activity era. Now, by the way, the, the right hand, I would say, yeah, but it's more active now than the previous high activity era. Come on, you didn't even have satellite back then. So there's a lot of stuff we were not observing. And what is this from? This is from this Atlantic, we call multi-decadal mode, where you have areas of the Atlantic get warmer for a few decades, cooler for a few decades, warmer, and it's not necessarily heating up to make the storms. It has to do with atmospheric circulation patterns. And that's from the uh, paper in Science from uh, 2001 that we did. Uh, now, let me just summarize these increases, because this is huge. They talk about with global warming. When we switch from a low activity era to a high activity era, we're talking about the overactivity was double. The number of major hurricanes up by a factor of two and a half. In fact, someone recently had a paper and said, We've got three times as more rapid intensifiers, which are usually the major hurricanes recently than, say, 30 years ago. And I said, yeah, because we have two and a half times more major hurricanes than we did. You know, it, it's just this multi-decadal. The Caribbean hurricanes up by five, factor of five. And the October, November stuff, 10 times as much. And it's a return to the high activity previous year. So how do I summarize this? The, the historical studies, careful use of the historical record, find cycles with no long-term trends. 
in any measurement. The tendency of some, obviously we've seen in the media and certain scientific circles to attribute almost any increase in natural disasters. If it's bad, it must be AGW. That's really the bottom line. If it's bad, it has to, they want to scare people. And what I feel is the focus needs to be on continued improvements. That's what we do with Hurricane Research Center, the universities, the National Hurricane Center, on continued improvements to hurricane track and intensity models and understanding the real hurricane threat, get better public awareness and preparedness. So we, we end with the phrase, hope for the best, we prepare for the worst. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and consider donating to the Heartland Institute to support more vibrant free markets, greater individual liberties, and more videos like this one.